Ladies and gentlemen, we are back for another glorious edition of Ask That. My name is Clark Sell, and with me today, I have Jeremy Foster. Jeremy, how are you, sir? I'm great. How are you, Clark? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, before we even allude to what we're going to talk about, because I think it's a cool conversation, why don't you tell everybody who you are? Hey, everybody. I'm Jeremy Foster, and I work at Microsoft. I'm in our deve developer evangelism group, although our group does more um, coding with other companies now. We, we tend to we're, – we're, our group is called Commercial Software Engineering. We go to groups, big, big enterprises, and we write proof of concept projects with them. So it's really cool. I get to um, travel around and, and work on different projects, and I'm a little bit ADD, so that's good for me. <laughs> <laughs> so a good developer. Uh, That's right. Just, just pack in lazy and then we've got it all done, right? <laughs> we're there. All right. So uh, today we're going to talk about some IoT crazy uh, and this being uh, on floating water. Uh, that being the fact that you are, for lack of better terms, instrumenting your boat. Let's, yep. uh, let's tee it up a little bit. What, what are you doing? Okay, so this project started as kind of a passion project uh, a number of months ago. My, so my wife and I, uh, last summer, we bought a, a boat. Uh, it's a sailboat. It's a sailing catamaran, and it's great. And we're, um, we're looking through – I'm looking through all the systems on a boat. You know, system, boats are kind of like RVs, you know. They're like this collection of systems. You know, you've got all of the mechanics and then all the electronics and – and all the living stuff and the plumbing. I mean, it's just this big collection of systems that all have to work together. And when I see these little concentrations of systems, I go, oh, man, this is – there's all kinds of potential here there. for, like, data. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and, and control systems. Like, I, right now, I, if I want to turn on all the lights in the boat, I have to walk around to all these yeah, out, yeah. these outlets and flip a little switch, you know. So it's like light switch harvesting time, That's you right. know. Let's go turn should, all the you lights off. Just want to clap and be like, exactly. Both, yeah. Both if on. only there were a product where we could clap. Yeah. <laughs> so I see this and I go, man, this is perfect for an IoT project. And so I started this personal project I called IoT Afloat, but it was just kind of trying to work on it on the side and not a lot of time for it. But recently, I um, started getting involved with a few interns at Microsoft, and um, I said, hey, how about we work on this project? So now I've got some other minds on it, and we're having an absolute blast thinking of all of the different use cases that we can implement uh, when, like you said, we, we instrument a system like a boat. So, so that's, what, that's the gist of it. What does uh, Jeremy's boat afloat, what does the MVP look like? Okay, well, there is no M, there is no minimum, there is no maximum. Um, the, I think what we're going to kind of, what we're going to do is we're going to create the project. We're going we're to do the project as a core, and that is like get some of the, uh, the basics working. We need to implement the IoT subsystem such that we can um, put in a device and it will actually you know, read the temperature or whatever the sensor is and relay that to the cloud. So there we go. We've got the backbone of it. And we also need a web UI so that whether you're on the boat or off, you can log in and kind of see what all of the data looks like. Maybe turn the lights on, turn the lights off, whatever you might need to do to interact with the boat. We need a UI for that. So that, that IoT subsystem and the UI are our core. And then we've got a bunch of elective projects. So that's where we really start turning on scenarios. One of them is uh, we want to, right now, in order to get on the boat, you put a key in the lock and open it. And then you turn a little handle and you open the door. And we want to have a camera above the front door that's looking at whoever's standing in front of the door. And if it sees me and recognizes my face, it unlocks the door. So modern system, right? Sure, totally. Yeah. But we've got a few more. What? So what does the... Let's start with the hardware side of things. What's the hardware side look like to interface with the boat? Yeah. So boats have uh, an existing data system on them. They use one of two networks. Usually one's called NMIA0183. Oh. And the 83 there is literally from 1983. Oh, gotcha. So it's an, it's an old protocol. It's basically just a serial protocol over a wire. Okay. okay. And then the other so system is, this is a little bit like is this a little bit like the CAN bus in a car? So everybody knows that there's a there's a bus and whatever manufacturer of whatever thing just kind of throws shit on the bus yeah. and picks it off yep. the bus. 
Okay. Yep, it's a lot like that. Yep. Okay. And then the other system is called NMEA 2000. So same standards organization, but these two different ways of talking on a bu- on a okay. boat. And so if you have a GPS, it's going to use one of those. If you have uh, autopilot for steering the boat, it's going to have one of those. And that's a two-way, you know, so that you get information about what it's set to and you can set it. Sure. If you have like the position of your rudder or the direction of the wind, all of those things are going around on these two buses, these okay. NMEA buses. So the kind of the foundational hardware piece that we need is a system called an iCommunicate. It's a gateway that takes in all that old boat data and it turns it into a modern standard format. And the sure. standard format that we're going to use is called Signal K, which is it's a really cool data format. Um, it was developed in Europe, and it's basically like a, a, a schema for data that should be passed around on a boat, oh, okay. as well as a server for serving that data over a modern REST protocol with a WebSocket interface and all oh, of that. Really? So, yeah, so you plug in this one hardware device to your boat and plug in some feeds, and then, bam, you've got a nice REST URI. Wow. That you, can, that you can query your GPS location. You know, it's great. Wow. I, I wasn't yeah. expecting you to say that at all. I was expecting yeah. you to say, you know, I plugged in my serial cable and I'm trying to read this stuff off the wire. Yeah. Um, so where, how did this, this other effort exist in the first place? Is, I mean, it, what, what's, which other effort? Kind of, the I communicate? Yeah, I mean, I I'm deep into cars, and I don't know yeah. one that works with the CAN bus quite like that. It's, it's super. Well, that would be cool, actually. Yeah, the, that's a good idea to have one of those for a car. Well, I mean, it exists because the the NMEA standard is just absolutely set in stone. Oh. That's what every boat, every every vessel sure. uses is NMEA. And it's kind of terrible because they don't have the consumer's best interest in mind, frankly. Right. And so if a company wants to make a new GPS, they have to pay ridiculous amounts of money to, to make that NMEA compliant. And then that cost wow. has to be passed on to me who's buying the GPS. Sure. So it's just okay. terrible. And if I want to interface with it, good luck. You know, like I'm going to have to go digging into these protocols and try to use them. And it's just not friendly at all. It's one of those systems that you just know – that um, that modern digital systems have got to replace, and it's got sure, to go away. Sure. And and somebody felt that pain, and they made this system. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's. Uh, I, I, I did did not expect that to come out at all. Um, yeah. They, the way they designed it too, like if you consider what it pulls off of that existing bus to be a stream of data. Yeah. You can create another instance of the Signal K server, and then you can like merge that stream in, as well as submit any of your own to that stream. And so now you have this master stream of Signal K data that represents all data that happens on your boat, and you've got your legacy system feeding into it, and then you've got your modern systems feeding into it. So we're running this on. Go ahead. So, so back up a second. So why would you need the second one? I, I guess I, I've lost why you needed the second one. Well, because the iCommunicate is running on a, a, a packaged boxed black box system yep. for the most yep. part. You don't want to go modify that server and mm-hmm. submit data points, you know, into that stream of data. You just want to kind of merge that data in as is. Mm-hmm. And if you ever wanted to tap into just the legacy data, you want it to be what it is, as is. And you just want to merge that into your own that you do have control oh, over. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A little piece of so another where, if you will. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So now we've got like this one stream that's like reading all the old boat yeah. data as well as, you know, it's reading the temperature from a Raspberry Pi. So I got you. I got you. Yeah. And so then what, what are you primarily just interfacing with that device or are you also going around and littering your boat with tiny little devices to do smart little things. Yeah, lots of new um, devices. So the I, I'm really excited about the devices, actually. Everybody knows a Raspberry Pi. A Raspberry Pi is actually a relatively large um, and capable mm-hmm. system. And so it's I, I have a Raspberry Pi 3 that's actually the server of the boat. So it's going to be kind of installed in a central location inside the cabin behind the control panel. And that's where I'm going to be running the signal K that's, you know, pulling all these streams together. 
And that's also where I'll be running Microsoft Azure IoT Edge. And I can talk more about that in a bit. That's kind of cool because it makes, gives us the ability to make like a local, um, a local system that's able to communicate with the cloud. So I have this Raspberry Pi 3 that's my server. And then I have all these $10 devices, Raspberry Pi Zeros, that are sprinkled around the boat. And the Raspberry Pi Zero has wireless. So I have all these devices that are installed wherever I need them for $10 a piece, and they all communicate over Wi-Fi on this closed Wi-Fi mm. system. And so now I can put, say, um, as an example, I can put a Raspberry Pi Zero in one of the staterooms with a um, an output that controls whether the lights are on or off and an input that is a button for the lights. And now programmatically, I can say if somebody pushes this button, I want the lights to go off. But if I want to turn the lights off some other way, like by schedule, I can do that, right? Sure, I, can, sure. I can control them however I want. And maybe on that one Raspberry Pi, I also have the temperature and the humidity coming in, and I have a video feed. So if I want to install this in my son's stateroom, I can make sure that he's safe and asleep in his stateroom. And um, I can hook whatever I want up to that one Raspberry Pi Zero, and all of its data will get relayed to hmm. the server. Right. And then I can do that all over the boat. What's the limitations? Like, what's the upper bounds on <clears throat> on number of things per zero? It's really just a matter of processing power and reading values from GPIO pins and, and the, the, the buses, the serial mm-hmm. buses and stuff is really, really lightweight. So I imagine that there, I could probably with one Raspberry Pi Zero, I could probably handle hundreds of inputs. Oh, wow. I don't think I'd have any trouble with that at all. Sure. Have you the had only trouble? consequence would be that like maybe there was a few milliseconds delay before the light turns off or something. Yeah, that's going to be my next question. So what does the wireless layout look like on the boat? I mean, are you running into interference and things with, I'm assuming, fiberglass and steel? And have you, have you been in dark corners where it's you're having troubles getting signals? No, I mean, the boat's pretty small. It's a 34-foot boat. And so nothing is more than, say, 50 feet away from anything mm-hmm. else. And so even though there's fiberglass in between, the the signals are all pretty strong in between them, even though some of the devices are, you know, really, really small Wi-Fi antennas. It's sure. all been fun. Yeah. So then what about power to said devices? Are you running, running power? I assume you're running power or tapping off of, of yeah. power somewhere. Yeah. So that's, in my opinion, that's kind of the hardest part. I mean, if I, if I, if there was some infinite source of power on this Raspberry yep. Pi Zeros, I could just kind of pop them anywhere I wanted, you know, that'd be great. Yep. Um, what I have is 12 volt power on the boat and 12 volt power. Um, my, my favorite way to run it is just with a, um, a thin wire with a barrel connector on the end. And then I have a little device that turns, uh, 12 volt with, through a regulator into five volt micro USB. And that's what a, what you use oh, to right, power. Totally. Yeah, about that. Yeah. yeah. So those are pretty easy to run. And actually, since you're running, what I'd like to do is drop the, um, drop the 12 volts down to five right away. Yep. And then r- I haven't low done this voltage. yet, but I'd like to run that low voltage. And have you seen the wire that's flat? Uh-uh. They, they make this wire that's flat. Like you can actually see the copper. It's encased in plastic, but you can see the copper. But the copper is, it's the same amount of surface area as say a 20 gauge wire, but it's flattened out. And so when you s- tape it to your wall, or like 3M stick tape it to your wall, sure. it's pretty much gone, you know? You just see a, a, a little trace running along the wall. And so I'm, I'm thinking about using that to run the power here and there. But for the most part, you know, because boats are small, it's pretty easy to get 12-volt power anywhere. And it's already in the rooms because all the lights are 12-volt. So it's not that hard to find a good place for things. Do you worry about the draw that would be that would continue to happen? I mean, how... I granted, sure. it's only 5 volts, but if you haven't ran the boat in a week has, has that been enough to drop it a few volts such that you can't start the boat anymore no um it's 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 okay but one of the things that we haven't implemented in the system yet but we'd like to is a low power mode then maybe one that's intelligent so it detects that you're in on mm-hmm. battery and drops a bunch of stuff down so for instance if i run a live video audio stream from a raspberry pi zero um, I measured that, and it takes 300 milliamps, which is about the same as a relatively bright LED light that you would yeah. put on the ceiling of an R- of a room in an RV. Mm-hmm. So it's not that much uh, of a draw. Um, but if 
if I'm in, if I'm on battery and I know I'm going to be just sitting there all night and I don't want to be plugged into anything, I don't want to run the engine to charge them or anything like that, then maybe I want to drop it down to low power mode. So one of the systems, we're going to have a, um, a Raspberry Pi Zero in the engine room and we're going to have one at the, what, what I call the control panel, which is where the batteries are. And I want to have, a, I don't have this in, installed yet either, but I want to have a system for monitoring the battery bank. So yeah. it can tell me like, you know, you're at, 60% right now and, and maybe raise an alarm that says now you're under 30 it's time to charge the batteries and and maybe it, I can do like what we do on our modern computer systems where I say hey if it's under 50% kick it into low power mode yeah or whatever yeah, yeah I, I asked that because I actually am here on my desk have a um, particle with a GPS and all that and it's it's end state is in my 68 Camaro to help monitor not only where I take it but it's battery because it's it obviously sits like during the winter. Um, yeah. I don't always want to leave it on the battery charger just to keep the battery up. Um, mm-hmm. And so there's a whole slew of things that I want to be able to monitor um, from yeah. that guy. And um, just Yeah, just I guess on the boat and maybe in your car as well, there's a number of functions of a digital system that you want to work even when you're not using it. It's not like it's right. just for operating the, the vehicle. Right. It's like when I'm at home, I'd love to be able to check in on my boat and look at the cameras and look at the battery level yeah. and all of that. Yeah. Maybe yeah. turn all the lights off. Yeah. And there's a lot of things in a, in a, I don't want to say a debugging situation, but I'd like to know how fast the engine cools down and how fast it warms up. And when's the last oh, yeah. time I checked the oil, um, not and miles between oil. And I know that sounds kind of pompous, but it's not a car that I drive every day. And so some of those things get kind of uh, removed from my my being, and I'd rather the car just tell me like, "Hey, it's you need right. to change the oil." And sure, I could I could write it down, but I don't want to write it down. I, mean, <laughs> I don't want to write it down. I'm living in 2018. Me. I don't yeah. need to write it down. Right. That's um, right. So, uh, what then? Like taking that same kind of spirit, like what then do you want to collect on the boat? I mean, it's one thing to turn lights on and off, but uh, like you said, a boat is a complicated system of things. So mm-hmm. what's what's the kind of data on the boat that you want the most? What's the first things that you really want to extract out of the boat to do useful things? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I, I My philosophy is I want all the data. Sure. Every time a thing happens, like if a light comes on, that's interesting. And the cost of storing that in the cloud is is null. Yeah. And so I may as well save that and, and look at it later. You know, and that's why we have these services like in Azure, we've got Data Lake where, you know, you just drop data that you don't know if you're ever going to go back and look at it again. You know, and and that's fine with me to just store absolutely everything, because maybe at some point I go, you know what, there's a reason and value for me to go back and mm-hmm. do some analytics on this data. So so my my first rule is all of it. But but what are we what are we actually measuring? Well, that's that's where we get creative and we look at where I've got these Raspberry Pis sprinkled all over the boat and, and what kinds of sensors. And when you look at what sensors are available that starts to give you these ideas for the use case. Like, you know, the ubiquitous is temperature and humidity. For some reason, that's the first sensors everybody plugs into an IoT device. So you go, okay, temperature and humidity. Do I need to know the temperature inside my boat in every room at all times? I don't know. Not now, but maybe later. But what might I need to know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. As well as vibration, right? Like, wouldn't you like to know if all of a sudden your engine is vibrating more than normal? That's right. That'd be great. Yep. And then I'm going to put a device at the top of my mast. The main reason why is because can you imagine the the camera view straight down onto a sailboat from the mast? That's an that's a uh, really valuable camera feed on a boat because if I'm pulling into a slip on my catamaran, oh, yeah, yeah, there's yeah, areas yeah. Of the boat I can't even see. Yeah. But if I'm pulling into a slip and I've got a nice feed in front of me, it's like having a camera on your car, a 360 yeah. camera, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I want yeah. one up there. Go ahead. I would say you can either put um, um, like the sonar sensors on places of it, so you knew what your actual proximity was to the to oh, yeah. dock too. Absolutely, yeah. You can put those on the side of the boat. Yeah. Now, there's this really cool sensor that I found out about. You know, have you ever seen the um, 
the uh, spinning thing on the yep. top of a boat, on the top yep. of a mast. That's measuring the, the speed of the wind, right? Yep. And then there's the arrow, the yep. wind axe, that's measuring the direction of the wind. Yep. Well, that's a very um, uh, hardware approach, yep. a mechanical approach to measuring two things, the speed direction and the yep. speed velocity. Well, there's a system that uses um, three um, transponders, three sonar transponders, okay. and and by using three, it can triangulate. And what it actually does is it sends out pulses. And if you imagine if the wind is blowing against you, then if you're trying to send uh, audio ag- against the wind, mm-hmm. it's going to take mm-hmm. longer, right? Because audio sure, is just air moving. Yeah. Yep. And so because it's a triangle, it can it can figure out with this one solid state device with three little sonic transponders the exact speed and direction of the wind. And how and big now is you don't have, to have any moving parts? How big is that device? Really small. I, I think they're I think they're six or eight inches in diameter, approximately. Wow. Uh, yeah. All, the triangle itself is. Yeah. Right. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So now you've got you know a more modern solid state. Yeah. It's durable. Yeah. It's more scientific measurement as opposed to well this thing's spinning at this speed and our multiplier is X. So here's how fast we think the wind is going. Yeah. Totally. I I mean. It- one of the first things I had thought about when you were talking about instru- instrumenting the boat would have been how does weather and wind and all of that, what does my day look like? You know, could oh, I be yeah. more productive if I've turned a sail, you know, two degrees? Um, yeah, people go with that. And, you know, I used to work at a company where we did machine learning algorithms and one of the executives was a big sailor mm-hmm. and he was on some big boat and they did a big project on that. And it was very fascinating, but it's, it's generally very difficult because you have to have a lot of sensors for things like the angle of the boom and the tension on the backs, the, the back mm. hall and the tension Let's on the see. foot and all kinds of measurements to, to make really good sense of it. But then, yeah, you can create a model that basically tells you based on the current wind speed and direction and current and all of that, here's where to trim your sails. And shoot, if you've got enough money, you can even make a boat that does it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, has there been any thoughts of over overlaying? I mean, I'm sure there's um, uh, sailing data out there that has the storms and the weathers and the wind and all that. Any any like meshing the two, kind of an outside recording of the day versus your of GPS recording of things to see like, Hey, we went this way. And then, Oh, the weather was like this. And the current was like this, even though you didn't collect it, you just kind of yeah. collected where you were at. Yeah. Well, there's a system that I'm, I'm pretty excited about. I haven't uh, actually purchased it yet, but it's, there are lots of navigation systems for boats. There are some that are open source and, and don't tend to be as good, but there's one that's not open source um, that I like by Rose points called uh, coastal explorer. And they've got a really good system. They they designed the UI really well, and they made it such that you can customize the UI. You can even bring in camera feeds. And mm-hmm. so I could bring in a camera feed of, you know, from the top of the mast, and I can create a completely different layout for what I want my screen to look like when I'm at anchor versus while I'm actually underway. And, oh, interesting. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited about that because with that one, you can overlay weather information, current and tide information, with the actual charts and you can pull those charts from any source you can pull those chart vector charts from noah for free or you can pull in raster charts and and it overlays all that stuff so that's pretty great because it's really good at integrating with um these other custom systems so that's going to be my strategy for for overlaying the two yeah yeah that's cool what do you think has been the hardest thing to date you know, just getting started, finding the time to get started. I mean, in every software project I've ever been in, you know, you you do a bunch of architecture and planning and thinking up front, yeah. and then no, what do they say? The best, pl- even the best plans don't survive first contact with the enemy. Yeah, yeah. As soon as you dig into it, you realize, oh wow, it doesn't work like that. We're gonna have to do this. We're gonna have to do that. And all of those are little hurdles that you can get over. Yeah. But there's no. There's nothing that you can really get you over the the gigantic hurdle up front that we only have so many hours in the day and we're all nice and busy and we've just got to get started. So I think that's the hardest part of it. <laughs> Not the technological have, hurdle, but the time hurdle. 
have you um, obviously a boat is a giant piece of equipment to drag to you know your house to do testing so have you created a mock boat that has mock um, raspberry pi uh, structure on that yeah, actually, so my language of choice and framework of choice is JavaScript and Node.js. I'm just really passionate about it. And I love it because the I'm following an isomorphic design for the code base that sits on all of the sensor devices, so all the Raspberry Pi Zeros. Sure. And and I, I basically just implemented it with roles. So, like, let's say this Raspberry Pi Zero, I'm going to put it at the head of the mast. Yep. And so that's its role right now. But if I wanted to swap it out with another one, I would basically just configure its role and it would use that code. And so I can spin these processes up, these node processes up on my computer. And I do that quite often. I'll just bring up a console with like my, my main data stream and my, I have a mock data stream that mocks all of that boat sure. data, the GPS sure. data and stuff. So it basically just acts like there's a boat driving around somewhere, reading weather data and all of that coming in through these legacy and Mia systems and that streams being populated. And then I spin up five or six of these Raspberry Pi zeros, each with a different role configured. And all of those are streaming their data up to the mainstream. So yeah, it's very, it's very, um, it, usually I'm developing in that environment and not on the actual boat. Yeah. Yeah. It was the kind of a leading question, but <laughs> what, what's deployment look like then? Are you, you got some sweet little, uh, you know, Travis uh, CI thing that uh, mm -hmm. you're kind of pushing down to the boat? It, Travis CI is probably the most likely as far as my uh, pipeline, but I, I'm not real good with DevOps, <laughs> Chris. I, I, I've never I've never been great at it. Um, but there's one thing I really like to do is create a GitHub hook that essentially yep. where the device itself is, it's always online anyway. Yep. Um, it, if it sees that I've checked into GitHub, it just pulls yeah. down the latest. And that's a yeah. pretty easy hook to create. And so I like to do that because then I have control of the whole thing and I'm not using somebody else's software. Yeah. I, I have a radon controller that's ran by a, a device and it's got the same thing. You know, anytime the commit changes on GitHub, it pulls it down and then restarts itself and away she goes. I don't have to yeah. worry about it. Yeah. Did I just call you Chris? You did, but it's okay. It's Clark. It is. <laughs> it, it happens. Right. It, it happens so often. Really? Uh, that, with Chris specifically? Huh? Well, yeah. With, with Chris, Chris specifically? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And of course, when I was at Microsoft, I got. Um, it I always get confused with Chris Sells, which. That's probably no, what I did. No, no relation. I've signed his name on books because I felt bad for the person who thought that they met Chris Sells, <laughs> and I just signed it for him. I'm like I didn't really want to bust their bubble. Like, no, it's, wait, it's wait, that's me. illegal. Is it? Well, I signed it, Clark Sell. I didn't sign it, Chris Sell. I just, oh, I just I signed the book because <laughs> <laughs> you were asked to. That's right. Well, you signed it. Sure, it's not me though. Yep. <laughs> Never know whether to disappoint somebody or not. Um. So like what's next with the boat where, I mean, you're in kind of, you're in, in dev mode. Yeah. When does, when does, uh, when does this start going live? When does this get out there? Well, the intern project, we've got some milestones. So one's at the end of May. Uh, we're recording this here at the beginning of May. So we got about a month to the first milestone. And then the next milestone is at the end of June. So I should back up. At the end of May, we'd like to have the core stuff working. At the end of June, we'd like to have some of what we call the electives working. So I told you about the one elective, which is you stand in the cockpit and the cabin door unlocks yeah. for you. Another one, which I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not a deep expert on AI and ML, but I can see that it's, it's going to be an absolutely gigantic topic for all developers in the near future. Yeah. And so I'm excited about it and I'm, and I'm working on it. But one of the electives that we're going to do is what we call the critter alert. So when you're sailing, you know, you may have everybody under, under, uh, in below decks in the cabin and one person out on deck and they may or may not see that there's a pot of porpoises right there or there's a sure. whale over there. Maybe you've got it on autopilot and everybody's distracted. Well, we've got cameras uh, already. And so if we just basically train a model to detect critters in the water, like the hump of a whale or, or something yeah. like that, then we can do two things. We can raise an alert because everybody wants to come up on deck and see it. Yeah. But we can also start taking pictures, right? Because you yeah. know how hard it is to get that picture of yeah. the whale right yeah. when it comes up, yeah, you know, yeah. but when it sees a whale tail, it better be taking that picture for you, yeah. right? 
So that's critter alert. And then another part of it, another piece is, um, oh, I've got these written down. I forgot. We've got the critter alert. We've got the, um, the door lock. And then I'm blanking on the other ones. What's your, what's your connection up to the cloud? Oh, I need to talk about that part. So we've got a, I've got an antenna and a router that are, that's specifically made for the marine environment. And this antenna is like a hardcore Wi-Fi antenna. So if I'm at a marina or something, even though the marina is 300 feet away, I should be able to get the marina Wi-Fi when it's parked um, at its home on my dock. Um, I can get my own Wi-Fi. So anytime hmm. it's at home, I have a really good Wi-Fi connection. And the way, because it has a router on the boat, any devices that I have on the boat are always talking to the same SSID. Sure. Sure. And for instance, if you came over and visited me and you got on the boat, you would connect to this one. And the next time you visited, it would be the same one, yeah. even if we're, if we're in a different marina. So that's yeah. convenient. So I have this subnet on the boat. And oftentimes, though, I mean, I have to, this is a, a uh, hard requirement that sometimes we're offline. Like we're yeah. out in the middle of the Puget Sound or let's say we were out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. There's no connection to the cloud. I don't want to pay for satellite. And so I am offline, but I still want everything on the boat to work like it did. When I push the button to turn the light off, I want the light to go off. Whenever I, a, a sensor needs to read the temperature, I want it to be able to report that temperature. Mm-hmm. And so what we're using is Azure IoT Edge which is like a, a local code base that is good at syncing with Azure IoT. And so I can still submit to Azure IoT Edge and say, hey, I just read the temperature and it's this. And then half a second later, hey, I just read the temperature again and it's this. And all of that goes into this edge. And then whenever I come home and I connect to my Wi-Fi, the whole thing just uploads to Azure IoT and that, that data is there as soon as it possibly could be. Sure. Yeah, that's uh, that's cool. Yeah. The good old online offline. The yeah, right. The best scenario of the world. Yeah. And then Edge lets me create modules um, that each of those modules can do a different thing. So I kind of create a workflow for my data. So maybe I want to filter my data and batch my data. Maybe I want to do some um, machine learning or some stream analytics on my data. Any of those things I can do in these Edge modules. And then those are just containers, Docker containers, actually. And so I can mm-hmm. run those either on the cloud or on the, the edge, whichever one I want. Mm-hmm. So maybe I get back to the port and I'm like, I need to do all kinds of ML stuff, but I've got a really nice connection. So I don't want to use my Raspberry Pi. I want to send right. this to the cloud. Right. Yeah, totally. You were, oh, yeah, that's all right. Do you worry about the chattiness at all? I mean, do you, that could get, that could be a pretty fat pipe at times, depending on how much you're collecting. Yeah. Um, I haven't worried about it yet. Um, it's a, certainly a concern for a system like this. And I would hope that I'll be able to put some metrics in place that, that kind of figure out if all of, if any of the node zero, the pi zeros are taxed, you know, if they're having a hard time with data yeah. or if my central server is having a hard time. Oh, yeah. And, and if so, then, you know, where's that coming from? What do I need to do? And, and probably there's some, some concessions, some very reasonable concessions that can be made like, do I need to know the temperature in the stateroom yeah, yeah. every half a second? Yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> Maybe not. Yes, yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you I absolutely have do. to have that. No, it has to be continuous. Right. No, but there could be something where you actually measure it every half a second, but you only publish it when the, the temperature changes, you know, a degree right. or, or two degrees. That's absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. And that would be something that I would probably do in an edge module. You know, I would determine... Like how, how much do you even care about this? And then, and kind of change it from a stream. Like whenever you're measuring things like the temperature every half second, that's just like, that doesn't feel right to me. It feels like audio sampling, you mm-hmm. know? Uh, what I really want to know is what was the temperature? And like you said, if it hasn't changed in an hour, then I should be able to represent that with that one piece of yeah. information. And so I want to change it from a stream to an event based thing. Yeah. And I can just measure it every second, and when it changes, raise an event. The temperature yeah. changed to uh, 69, you know. Yeah, what's your sensitivity to, to change and yeah. tweak that one over? Did you do that with the GPS on your on your device in your car? Uh, no. Um, I, I'm i not sure. That's a, that's a new project, and, you know, I worry a lot about things like the battery going dead 
Um, the on-off scenario is is a is an important one, um, mm -hmm. and since it's an old car, old cars are dumb. So I have <laughs> the ability to right. There's no computer, right? So everything's analog. Like I can right. read the oil pressure, I can read the um, temperature, and so there's some calibration that needs to happen of like what does that analog signal look like relative to what it is. Um, yeah. There are some um, digital things that happen based upon the sensor, like that you would have in a transmission to that of the gauge. So I'm not okay. entirely sure how I would like recalibrate off of that. Um, yeah. So then you, but then you ask, your, then you get to ask fun questions. Like, do I really need to know the miles per hour off of the transmission? Not really, because I have a GPS. So I could get it off of the GPS. Oh, yeah. But yeah. knowing the revolutions that are happening on the transmission, I can do things and I can do, I can then start to understand where, how hard the car was being pushed. You could overlay that with the accelerometer data of, of that. So were you redlined but standing still? Well, then you must have been doing a burnout, right? So mm -hmm. now you can, you could do a little bit more intelligent type stuff um you know somebody used a, some terminology recently that i really liked it was let's go from uh, move from data events to domain events mm. and i was like what do you mean and and I, I like it because like a data event is um the transmission started turning started rotating that's a yep. technical measurement you know mm -hmm. but the domain event is um we're doing a burnout and it's a combination of other information, and, you know, right. that you, you it's kind of like a sensor fusion. You know, in phones, yeah. we've got all these really low level sensors. But yep. what we really want as a developer is to roll that up and say, well, what does that mean to me yep. or what does that mean to the user? Well, if they're standing still and the transmission's going yep. crazy, then or the RPM's real high, then th this is a domain event that's raised. And now yeah. you can act on that. Yeah. Yeah. I, and again, it's an old car, so there's no computers. And the thing that. I have found uh, the most frustrating is trying to get it tuned right. And some of the, all of the tuning um, either happens with analog gauges or by your own feel. Um, mm -hmm. So like you driving, uh, sailing the sailboat, like you, you know instinctively if you need to kind of turn the sail a little bit to catch the wind better. That's just how you've yeah. been trained. Yeah. Well, I go find a 75 year old guy who grew up with these cars and he can go sit in a car or she can sit in a car and go, yeah, well, your ignition timing is off by just a hair. Let's go oh, turn yeah. it. And, and then suddenly like the car wakes up. Well, the reality about that though, is you, you could track the spark and you could track how hot it is. I mean, these are what cars do today, right? This is why we have, mm -hmm. they're just piles of server rooms driving around. They watch right. the spark. They watch the, the how often it's been delivered, how fast it's been delivered against the fuel that's being consumed and the speed and the transmission speed. And that's how we got better fuel economy because we got smarter mm. about how we would make that burn or make that burn hotter or whatever. And so um, it's a, it's an interesting, you know, to your point, what, domain. What models. I think what I think is interesting about that is that at some point that 70 for 75 year old subject matter expert, the guy with the feel of it, you know, his his knowledge had to influence those decisions that were programmed into it. Yep. And we can do that explicitly, but it's a long, hard process getting the domain expert to talk to the engineering. Or we can also do that with the modern machine learning models where you get some feedback into the system where hmm, somebody yeah, yeah. who knows what they're talking about says that was yeah, good yeah. or that was bad. Right. And now we're training a system and we're, we're, we're basically programming in a way that we don't even we don't even have fine control over the bits, you know. Yeah. Yeah, really yeah, fascinating. A, it is fast. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I always worry uh, that when that generation of car file enthusiasts, or yeah, enthusiasts yeah. when that yeah. one goes away, there's a there's a generational bit of knowledge that leaves. Um, oh, yeah. And it's uh, it's a bit sad. Uh, not that others are. There is a bit of a resurgence today. But to see somebody sit down and like, oh, we can get you hundred more horsepower and he pulls out his die grinder and just starts whittling away at the motor. And like, <laughs> okay, let's do this. <laughs> right. Like that's, that's just a different way of, you know, approaching the problem. Well, when, when that generation dies off at what are we left with? We're, we're left with 
algorithms, mm -hmm. and worse yet, machine learning models that we don't really make any sense of. And maybe we can like look at their output, but there's nobody left that knows why that model works the way it does. Yeah. It just does. It was influenced by that expert. And, and, and so I, I that is a, a bit of a worrisome situation to me, you know, I mean, we, we have new skill sets that will rise up. I'm not worried about sure. like job loss, but I am worried about like the loss of that feel, the loss mm -hmm. of that intimate knowledge. Yeah. I mean, to some degree, I mean, the United States is in this like trade, the trades deficit of people who, you know, are the, the welders and the plumbers and the guys who know yeah. how to, guys and girls know how to do that thing with their hands and has that art, art artisan experience over the generations and years yep. and yep. Many things have been passed down. And uh, it's, I mean, it's interesting times for sure. Do you ever watch uh, maker videos on YouTube? Oh, yeah. Oh man, that, that's just awesome because it's actually one of the things I love about software de development is that this is a craft where we are creating things, um, but there's, there's art to it. You know, we create UIs and we create architectures. So there's both. There's a, it's a, it's a creative, um, creation, but it's also a function that serves a role. And I've always loved that. And the last few years, I've just been, steeped in maker concepts and this idea of bringing something to life. And, and I love it when I see a maker system as something where you have material design. So you design something and you build it out of mm -hmm. wood or metal yep. or, or something real, you know, yep. and then you put in electronics and now yep. it can be controlled. It's a system that can be controlled. And then you put in software and the software yep. can speak through the electronics and make this yep. thing actually move around. And then you add um, connectivity to the cloud. And then that's where everything really opens up. And the, the, the things can communicate with other things and they can communicate with your, you know, yep. your online functions or whatever yeah. you want. Yeah, I, I, um, I have a, a radon fan. We have radon in our house. Um, and the solution is to you put a – well, we have an active system. So we create a vacuum from underneath the basement floor. And um, that vacuum sucks the air out and there's a fan that sits outside and it just runs constantly. Well, we live in the north. Oh. And so um, obviously uh, it snows. And when it snows, we have there's a four inch pipe and a, a fan that's on this four inch pipe. And so this fan is running. And of course, what happens in the winter is it sucks all this warm air or warmer air from underneath the basement floor right from that vacuum. Oh, and wow. Yeah. Sends it up a 20 foot pipe. And of course, what happens when it's cold? <laughs> well, the air condensates and it comes back down. And um, if it's cold enough, it starts to freeze. And once enough has frozen, once that, you know, that that ring starts to get closer and closer, right? Now you lose your vacuum. And so yep. now the purpose is completely gone. And yeah. I just created a very, very simple um, device that reads temperature in the pipe, temperature outside. It reads the vacuum. And when the state starts to change, like it sees that we're below freezing or we're, the vacuum is starting to go away, then shut the fan off and turn mm. on a de-icer. And so I have just a gutter de-icer that's wrapped around where it always yeah. freezes. Yeah. Or warm the pipe up so that the pipe can drain or so that it yeah. doesn't freeze and it can drain. Turn the fan off and give it time to catch up. And then when the weather becomes good again, then turn the fan back on. Huh. And ever since then, it's been fantastic. Oh, I've wow. Never, I've never froze. And the whole premise was just keep the fan running longer. Yeah. It, all right. So it goes off for a, a night. Big deal. Yeah. Once it's frozen to get a four inch you know, cylinder of ice to un unfreeze is yeah. really, really hard. Like that takes yeah. weeks in right. when you're outside and it's already cold. But if you just turn it yeah. off, then you'll be able to turn it back on in the next morning. And it just happens automatically. Like I've, it's been years. I've never been frozen. So did, how how much ice collects on it before the system kicks in and fixes it now? I have no idea. Oh, <laughs> you don't even have to care. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's 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 tweaked enough to where... Like all I would do is play with the temperatures a little bit and see when the mm -hmm. vacuum starts to come off. And when that temperature hits, oh, I think I've got it. Um, I don't know. I think it's like if it hits 20 degrees, maybe. So it's not even like at the freezing point. 
if it starts yeah. sitting there, just turn it off. Um, I think I turn a de-icer on when it's, you know, maybe below freezing, but I don't turn a fan off until it's 20 degrees. And uh -huh. that was just enough that, you know, for us that it works. Yeah. Man, that's great. I, it's such a that's simple really solution cool. to the problem, right? Yeah. Um, anyways, it's, uh, we, we, we now don't smoke in the house because, you know, the radon is gone. At least... <laughs> <laughs> for 363 days out of the year maybe not maybe not all of them um all right at the end of every one of these um i like to uh send a bit of gratitude and acknowledge the other person and with that being said um, i want to acknowledge you for your uh relentless involvement in the community um, not just for being here and sharing the conversation today but really being out there i mean you write a lot you speak a lot at all the conferences you're out doing and showing and, and spreading the good word. And, and um, I, I know that it can take a toll on one's family when you're traveling all over the place. And I mean, here you guys are moving to a boat just because of all the undue stress that has happened. Uh, but I, I genuinely want to say thank you for, for being out there and participating. So. Well, thanks Clark. You too, for sure. <laughs> my, my last question for you. Um, and it's one that I've asked everybody is how, how do you define community and what does it mean to you? Um, so are you familiar with graph theory, um, you know, yeah. that made popular by Facebook's graph API and, yeah. you know, these connections that are formed yeah. when you have a large system like Facebook. And I, I love graph theory. It's so amazing. And I think what uh, a realization I had some years ago is that in graph theory, you know, if you just think about a whole bunch of interconnected nodes, and even if you're not a computer scientist, you know what this looks like, you know, just a bunch of dots connected together with lines. The interesting thing about that is that what is the, the most important thing about it is not necessarily the dots, the nodes, you know, and the properties of those nodes. It's the properties of the connections between the nodes. Yep. And, and so in, in my, in my opinion, uh, relationships are more important than any given person, any given entity, any given organization. And that's what I love about uh, any community, specifically the communities that I'm in, the developer communities. When we get together and, and share things, some magic happens. I mean, I can go make a system for my boat and great. Now my boat, you know, works the way I want, or you can, you can keep your radon tube from from icing up, and that's awesome. But it's all the more awesome. It compounds when you share that, and so I I just think that magic happens, and I think that a lot of us recognize that and are attracted to that and want to facilitate that. So yeah, this is a really cool space. I agree, and I spend every day doing it. Yeah, <laughs> I know you do. It's fun. Uh, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for spending your time with us today. I'd like to hear what kind of crazy IoT project you've done. I'm sure you've done something to enable your house or lawnmower, maybe, <laughs> car, robot. Jeremy, thank you for your time today. How can people get a hold of you? Where can they find they you? They can find me. Yeah, the easiest way to find me is at codefoster.com. Over on the left is all my contact info. So I'm on Twitter at codefoster. I've got my email there. It's all there. Perfect. Well, it's been a fun chat. We'll see everybody next time. See everybody.